Good morning, class. This will be our last lecture, last virtual lecture. Uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy these lectures or be able to use them as a resource for some of your learning during this time. Today we're going to be talking about movement in adulthood, specifically older adulthood. We've kind of already, we've talked a lot about prenatal, neonatal, infant, early childhood, late childhood, and then we're going to skip kind of the regular adulthood or normal adulthood, like, you know, kind of what we all experience now, even though there's a lot of research on that. It's probably the most amount of research is done on just normal adults, but we're going to now jump into older adulthood because this is another area of uh, great interest for public health and also a, a very critical stage to try and maintain movement patterns that we've learned through adulthood uh, to help prevent uh, a lot of uh, major kind of issues that can occur that can lead to mortality in older adults. Okay, so let's begin. So let me move myself out of here. Okay, let's see if I can just kind of squeeze myself in. Maybe I'll try to shrink this down. Something like that. Move myself over here, maybe. Right there. Okay. I'm very small, but that'll be okay. Okay. So, trends in older population. You've probably already known about this, but the proportion or the percentage of um, people in the United States under the age of five has been declining. So we're about here right now. Okay, so we're actually at this kind of cross section as you can see on this graph. Let's see if I can find a better tool here. Laser pointer. Okay, so we're about right here where the percentage of people under the age of five and the people percentage of people age 65 and up is about equivalent. And it's predicted now to basically continue to increase. We know this trend to be true because previous generation was the baby boomer generation or the, the generation now that's getting into this age range of 65 and up is the baby boomers. And they're called the baby boomers because their parents loved making babies. And uh, this has now kind of been the consequence of all of that baby making has going to have a very high number of uh, seniors. So seniors defined as people 65 and older. And uh, the current generation uh, is not so into making babies. And so the overall uh, rate of uh, new babies in the world is expected to decline. And so we have this discrepancy here where we have more older adults predicted in the year 2050, uh, about almost double the number of older adults or more than double the uh, portion, percentage of older adults to uh, children uh, within the next 30 years. So this can be somewhat problematic, especially since who's going to take care of these older adults if we have fewer and fewer newer adults coming into the fold to take care of them. So something we need to consider as far as uh, these things. One possible solution, though, is perhaps we can create policies and programs that might be able to help them out to maintain their uh, kind of normal standard of care for themselves. They have uh, uh, be able to continue to participate in activities of daily living without having to have a caretaker for them. But of course, as you'll understand, is that concerns with increasing age is that there's more chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, increase in frailty. This is basically a complex health state of increased vulnerability to stressors due to impairments in multiple systems, and those systems being vision, muscular, uh, skeletal, um, sensory systems, cognitive systems, emotional systems, all of these things can, in conjunction with one another and feed off one another, um, decline. Had to cough. Um, but, so, but if we can keep the population healthy, active, independent, and socially engaged, we might be able to prevent a lot of these chronic diseases, right? So it's important to reduce the incidence of these conditions. So for two reasons. 
reduce healthcare costs. We're only going to have so much money in the healthcare system that if we can reduce the overall cost, we can also reduce the, in conjunction with reducing the tragedy of death and disability, then we really have a win-win. So that the amount of money that we have in the healthcare system can go towards trying to treat other diseases that may in large be preventable um, in this older adult population um, and also in doing that we'll also be able to reduce the overall number of deaths and disabilities that we see in this older adult population. So why study motor development in adulthood? It's there's a variety of reasons for all the reasons we just talked about obviously. Um, what we know about older adult, about adulthood can also be applied into the older population. So, to be able to create effective studies, create viable programs, maintain optimal health and productivity, this can all lead to decreased societal costs and an increased quality of life uh, for these older adults. And this is ultimately the goal that we want to achieve. Uh, but we have to kind of understand what is going to be an effective policy, what is going to be a viable program. And this is probably something that changes um, every 10 years, right? We can't just say we're going to put in one type of policy or one type of program that's going to work because the needs and the motivations for older adults every 10 years changes because our society has changes in conjunction with that. And so attitudes and wants and desires of older adults is something that also has to kind of be uh, played to or pl kind of be uh, needs to be something that we create programs to that help contribute to those things to help us uh, better create those policies and programs. And so it's something that kind of changes over time. So movement issues in adults, uh, balance and postural sway. Postural sway is kind of even you're never able to stand perfectly still. Okay, if you're an adult if you're a parent who has kids, you understand that children do not stay perfectly still, even when you ask them to. But even yourself, you always have a little bit of variability when you're standing or sitting, uh, you know, when you actually have an upright posture. They always have a little bit of sway. The variability in that, so kind of how much of that sway we see or the increased kind of movement of that sway increases uh, as we get into this older adult phase. And this can create problems that means kind of have less control over being able to maintain or control that sway. We also see changes in walking patterns. Um, and these changes in walking patterns can also lead to an uh, increased incident of falls. And falls is the number one thing that is probably uh, number one, preventative, and also going to lead to the greatest increase in um, mortality, along with cardiac disease and metabolic syndrome and cancer. Driving is also something that can become impaired uh, with age, and we'll get into why. Activities of daily living is something that we want them to be able to maintain as much as possible because the moment that those activities of daily living drastically reduces, this is when we really see signs of that they're going to need uh, a, 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 a caregiver in the home or they need to be put into or they're going to require um, be uh, put into housing like a nursing home that will be able to take care of them or uh, this is also going to be considered signs of um, dementia and other types of problems. So this, acti this reduced in activities of daily living is something that really needs to be paid attention to. Overall movement speed, as we kind of understand, is uh, reduced. And the maintaining of movement ability is something that also changes as a function of age as well. And how to maintain that is something we'll talk about today as well. So balance and aging, the ability to control body's position and space for maintaining static position or engaging in dynamic action. So static balance is if the base of support is constant, base of support, so let's say you're standing, it's within you know the area of your two feet on the ground. And you can kind of move your body around while you keep that base of support, and that's your static balance. 
so you can shift your weight from left to right and your center of mass is going to be moving over that base of support but the base of support itself is not going to be moving dynamic balances now if you intend to walk both the base of support and the center of mass are going to move and this essentially creates some sort of locomotion uh, intended or otherwise but the loss of balance is a major contributor to the number of falls so if your center of mass moves outside of your base of support and your base of support is not able to shift and catch that center of mass in time this essentially is what creates a fall okay so we see changes in gait that try to compensate for the inability to move the base of support fast enough to be able to catch the center of mass during this dynamic balance types of uh, movements okay i would try to um demonstrate this if i had that webcam i talked about so many weeks ago but the demand for webcams has been so great it has yet to arrive so i haven't been able to do anything that i intended to do in this class movement based much to everyone's chagrin okay moving on uh, balance and aging it's dependent on several things so vision the vestibule the inner the inner ear ability so uh, kind of gives a vestibular system again is your head in space um, and the orientation of your head in space proprioception your ability to sense your body in space um, these things uh, the proprioception is the greatest contributor to balance so imagine even if you had vision and even if you had a, an intact vestibular system and very rarely this is something this is an example of how important it is uh, a person can have a stroke in an area of the brain that basically is the in the pathway that delivers proprioception information to the brain and when that stroke occurs that pathway is severed no more proprioception information can enter the brain thus proprioception is gone these individuals are so dependent on vision to be able to walk that if you were to take vision away they would fall over now obviously if you took your vision away since you have an intact proprioception system and vestibular system that doesn't happen right um, there's even ways to modulate the vestibular system where you can pass a kind of very low current to the cochlea which is kind of uh, you would put in a, a, a kind of electrical pad behind the ear and you can disrupt the vestibular system and then you can cut out aging and you can have people stand on like a foam uh, mat foam kind of pad that's one feet or two feet and you can see how the disruption of each of these systems contributes to the overall disruption of a person's static balance um, now uh, also muscle strength is very important so the ability to react or to actually make that reaction so you might have the intention of reacting but your capability to actually follow through with that reaction is going to be very dependent on muscle strength and so reaction time is not so much a decline of the nervous system's ability to send signals it's really a contribution of the uh, muscles not being able to twitch fast enough to be able to uh, make that reaction as quickly right um, so that's another thing that can kind of play a role so ability to react quickly to external stimuli so to react quickly kind of comes into muscle strength um, and also to carry through that motion so even if you're able to make the motion in time if your leg that's trying to catch you as you're beginning to stumble isn't strong enough to be able to kind of push yourself back uh, to be able to hold your weight you're still going to fall right even though you may have done everything correctly if you lack the strength to actually be able to carry out the movement then it's you're still going to fail you're still going to fall and so and another thing that contributes is automatic versus conscious regulation of your balance and so as if these systems begin to decline you have to start to use more of your own kind of mental resources or cognitive resources to be able to attend to your ability to balance and if you're uh, having to put a lot of thought into being able to do that those resources get so put into being able to maintain balance that you're un then unable to do another type of task 
like being able to walk and grab something off the table or walk and talk or walk and do some kind of complex thinking. And this kind of division of cognitive resources doing this type of dual tasking kind of thing is what can also lead to uh, stumbles, trips, and falls. Okay, because you're not able to automatically regulate your balance, it requires you to have to kind of divide the limited amount of cognitive resources you have to be able to w balance in a way that, um, to be able to react in a way that's automatic enough for you to be able to catch yourself, if in case you do have to create make a reaction. So postural swaying aging. It's a, uh, we already talked about, it's this kind of imperceptible back and forth motion. Proprioception is more important than vision. Uh, it's refined across childhood and adolescence. So as you get older, when you become an adult, that's when you have the most kind of uh, least variable or the least amount of postural sway. Um, it increases linearly throughout. Thereafter, as postural mechanisms begin to deteriorate. So as we already talked about that, as you get older, uh, you go from having very little postural sway to the, these other things begin to deteriorate and your postural sway begins to increase. Uh, these declines can occur as early as 30, uh, but they're perhaps most pronounced and begin to become even more pronounced uh, by age 60. More muscle activity, more hip movement, and more overall joint activity in older adults helps to reduce the sway. So uh, age-related deterioration of the system of postural control declines in the ability to allocate attention optimally between postural control requirements and completing tasks. Males showed significantly more balance than females. This is probably because of how the distribution of weight and the overall strength of a male to be able to catch themselves and be able to actually follow through with that catch compared to females. Um, things that contribute to poor performance are being overweight, so the more weight you have to catch, the stronger you have to be to be able to catch it. Uh, low cognitive ability, so we talked about this ability to have to kind of put more attention kind of resources into paying attention to your postural sway or your balance and so this will contribute to not being able to react as quickly to external stimuli or a tumble or a fall so you won't be able to catch yourself as quickly because you can't react as quickly because you're not paying attention um, and a low self-perception of health so uh, if you don't believe that you are in good health uh, this kind of creates a kind of fear-based approach to movement that uh, continues to now emotionally kind of dysregulate your ability to be able to maintain balance and the use of psychotropic drugs. And so the psychotropic drugs meaning it can be things like uh, anything that affects the, the brain or the mind. Uh, in particular, this can be something like an antidepressant. So in older adults, there is an actual scale to measure depression called the geriatric depression scale. So depression among older adults is also something that is of uh, great interest to try and control. And if you take a drug that's trying to regulate your mood, it may have a side effect of disrupting your balance. And so these are all things that kind of these different domains, human domains we talked about, where you're trying to now improve the affective domain, the emotional domain, and it can have a consequence of having a negative side effect on the motor domain. And so these are all things that need to be considered when we're trying to develop therapies that are uh, best for our older adult population. So why is this research important? So to be able to diagnose individuals who may be susceptible to balance problems first and foremost, we want to be able to identify people before they're going to fall and break their hip. And as we've already talked about, and kind of been tested and retested on the class is that a hip fracture is a very uh, strong indicator of you have a low chance of um, survival after a hip fracture. About a year is when uh, on average you would expect to uh, uh, predict a death by from that hip fracture. That's why we want to prevent those falls, prevent those hip fractures, prevent those deaths by identifying those people early on. So enable earlier intervention to reduce the likelihood of falls. 
So how do we do that? We can try and increase strength. This correlates to the maintenance of balance across adulthood. So decrease the number and size of muscle fibers results in a reduction of strength and power production. So this is what I talked about where the size of the muscle fibers, the overall muscle quality. So muscle fibers as we get older, the fast twitch fibers tend to shift from fast twitch to slow twitch. We need those fast twitch fibers in order to be able to make those automatic movements, those fast movements, those strong movements to be able to catch and then um, move and then catch ourselves. So, and then also a combo of balance and strength related training regimens provide benefits and fall reduction. So not just strength related, but these balance things is really trying to improve uh, how to catch yourself. So the anticipation of if your center of mass goes outside your base of support, how are you now going to be able to catch yourself and balance and be able to kind of coordinate your muscles in a way that would allow you to now use your strength to be able to make that catch. Uh, change in walking patterns, these things, we would really want to focus on this. So there's a lot of changes in walking patterns and that can be used more kind of supplemental. Um, but this is a graph that I think is very important um, and this isn't going to be in the uh, slides on, on uh, web canvas on canvas so it's important to be able to watch this lecture because of that this is the only kind of hidden slide maybe I'll post it later but this is try to incentivize people to watch the lecture is that as you can see here this is basically median survival on the y-axis and age on the x-axis okay and here these lines indicate different gait speeds all right so the faster you are the greater an increase in survival the slower you are that chance of survival begins to decrease as a function of time so you can see here if you're a very slow 65 year old you have a very low chance of survival compared to people of a similar speed who are at 90 just about okay so this ability to maintain, I might even go further out than that, this ability to maintain um, speed, uh, gait speed, seems to be vitally important for being able to increase your chance of survival as you age. And so a lot of research is being put into, and efforts and programs are being put into, we just need to get adults to be able to have a sufficient gait speed to be able to improve their chance of survival. And so this is the kind of number one graph that a lot of people use to kind of justify like, okay, we have these older adults, we want them to be able to uh, have a good chance of survival, to be staying independent. Seems like one of the strongest things that uh, helps contribute to that chance of survival is gait speed. So we need to have interventions and programs that kind of help contribute to the maintenance or increase in gait speed as they get older. Now with age, gait speed is going to go down, but if we can try and get an intervention for people to kind of go from one threshold of gait speed to another threshold of gait speed, then we may be able to increase their overall chance of survival as age continues, uh, or as they continue to age, I should say. So falls, leading cause of injury among those over 65 years, leading cause of death resulting from injury. So not the leading cause of death, but um, definitely the when it comes to injury, it is the leading cause of death. So the risk of serious harm from falling increases with age, as we already talked about um, in age and in other types of scenarios, osteoporosis is a main contributor to hip fractures. So if you have an increased risk of falls and you have an increased risk of osteoporosis, those things going together is going to increase your chance of having a serious injury leading to death. Uh, and these things often, these two factors often are kind of collide at this age range of 65 and older. So this fear of falling, so as we talked about this low perception of health, leads to a cautious gait. And a cautious gait is basically just this shuffling of the feet that makes it very difficult for, uh, and makes it 
basically it's it's not a, a way to maintain gait speed this shuffling of gait you're not going to start walking faster it means that the muscles are not firing as hard you're more dependent on just a kind of um, slower twitch muscle fibers and so it's actually a, a means of detraining in locomotion terms um, of being able to reduce your gait speed so it's a contributor to reduce gait speed because it's something that is now an, an adapted behavior that is causing you to move more slowly because of that fear that you have of falling so the causes of this is one can be uh, related to physi physiology or cognitive ability and so you should just get tired so if you're uh, again with a sedentary individual it becomes detrained and then all of a sudden it's time to they want to go on vacation or something and they're walking around and then they experience a lot of fatigue when you're fatigued do you feel more or less coordinated do you feel more like you have better or worse balance if you combine the, that fatigue with an individual who has these other systems that have degraded such as proprioception vestibular or vision and then they have weakness on top of that that's a bad combination and if they have uh, early signs of osteoporosis or full-blown full osteoporosis that's a problem and then extrinsic is now environmental situations if now you're going on that vacation you're in a new environment you're trying to pay attention to all the things around you and then you don't see that curb you can fall and not be able to catch yourself and that leads to a hip fracture so contributing factors to falls among older adults um, intrinsic and extrinsic extrinsic causes alcohol use anybody who drinks too much alcohol you probably notice that your balance is not great improper clothing or attire darkness environmental obstacles irregular walking surfaces slippery surfaces uneven stairs cracked sidewalks these are things that perhaps you as an adult don't really consider to be like a, f a risk of fall you might trip and catch yourself but you imagine that these things now just a slippery surface is something that now can mean death that's really where you can understand where a fear of falling could come into medication brushing on the other side of this is all of the kind of natural things that can occur uh, with age so just a normal degeneration of these systems with age but then also other things that might contribute to um, these intrinsic factors can be side effects of medication such as dizziness and fatigue and so in most medications you're going to see side effects relating primarily fatigue and in many cases dizziness as well and so these are things that also need to be kind of uh, understood and managed when it comes to trying to um, incorporate some kind of lifestyle program to help improve something like gait speed so falls continue the consequences many never again functional walking so now they might go from walking to being in a wheelchair fractured hip talked about not good diminished confidence oh that hurt last time I'm a little worried now that fear of falling is now in I want to avoid physical activity altogether so to avoid falls um, there's other things that can happen to help um, improve or help avoid falls is that you know if there's something in the in the home that's uh, all of a sudden a floorboard has kind of come up try to repair that so now that's not an irregular surface for them to walk on make sure that they're not on two medications or multiple medications that are contraindicative to one another so two thing two medications that are okay in isolation all of a sudden you take them together and then it has a really bad side effect and it can completely full, throw off your equilibrium make you feel super dizzy and then you decide to go throughout your normal day and you experience a fall exercise regularly and periodic eye exams make sure that vision is something that is well maintained because vision is something that's super important to be able to identify obstacles in your environment and then be able to make plans and that to what to do to avoid those obstacles or overcome those obstacles so there's a tremendous number of strategies for avoiding falls in the home the bathroom is the one where most accidents occur in the home 
be cautious around wet, slippery surfaces. Keep non-slip rugs on the floor. Attach self-adhesive non-skid uh, appliques to the bathtub or shower floor. Be sure that wet clothes or towels do not drip on the floor. Install night lights. Okay, there's a plethora of them. In general, we'll just talk about do not run or rush through the house. Um, wear appropriate clothing and shoes with pliable soles and low heels. No more high heels when you're 80 years old. Place night lights throughout the house. Arrange furniture to so lanes of traffic are straight and wide. Keep furniture out of normal traffic lanes. Keep drawers, cabinets, and closet doors closed after use. Uh, driving trends in older adulthood, so by 2020, this year, 40 million older adult drivers on the road. More fatal crashes are experienced by drivers over 75 than all other age groups. And that's primarily because of a lot of reasons that we've already talked about. Same things that contribute to falls in aging uh, as far as normal degeneration of the musculoskeletal vision, proprioception, and vestibular system also contribute to this increase in fatal car crashes. 9% of older drivers accounted for 13% of crash fatalities. Age-related prohibition uh, is not a feasible solution. Uh, so you can't just say stop driving. Loss of driving ability can be considered a major life crisis. And so you're taking away an individual's independence. This is not a, this is going to be more harmful than it is helpful, regardless of what these numbers indicate. So that means that we have to have other kinds of interventions to help improve their ability to drive. So again, like we already talked about, things that uh, contribute to uh, declines in driving in older adulthood, vision and hearing, if you can't see what's coming, if you can't hear the honking, then that's a problem. Uh, processing and response time, so uh, not being able to know if uh, something is happening in multiple directions, uh, what action you should take, um, that's kind of a complex process that can re uh, cause reduced response time. Uh, chronic conditions, so older adults are more prone to chronic diseases whose symptoms and our medication requirements may affect driving ability. So again, medication is something that really has to be taken uh, strong consideration when, it, uh, when a doctor prescribes these things. Um, and individuals with diabetes or dementia are 1.5 to 3 times more likely to cause traffic accidents. Dementia uh, seems pretty obvious because the cognitive capacity and memory is definitely impaired. Diabetes might not seem as obvious, but one reason could be is that there's uh, people with diabetes can experience what's called a neuropathy, where they no longer are able to have strong sensation in the uh, in the limbs, specifically in the hands and the feet to start with, and so that lack of sensation can mean that it, they don't aren't able to well perceive exactly how well they're turning the wheel or how much force they're applying to the brake or the gas pedal of the car. So f factors related to declines in driving ability in older adults, uh, physical fitness and obesity. So the less physically fit you are, you might not uh, uh, kind of predict that, then the greater increase in your or greater decline in your ability to drive. Obesity is also another one of these things. That the uh, more obese a person is, the greater decline in their ability to drive. Um, why obesity? Well, interestingly enough, if a, people who are obese uh, are more likely to uh, experience what's called uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and those individuals therefore have disrupted sleep, being less restful makes you less aware, and that can con contribute to uh, in kind of more impaired driving. So there's even been studies that demonstrate that driving while unrested or having kind of broken sleep, you can drive as impaired as a person who has had a certain number of alcoholic beverages, um, like one or two, not terrible but certainly that's interesting that that kind this lack of sleep can contribute to a, a, an, an 
equal impairment to driving as that of the consumption of alcohol. So uh, it seems to also be related to declines in physical fitness. So you kind of have a double whammy here. So decreased physical fitness, people who have low physical fitness are probably also have a greater um, odds of being obese. And so there's a number of things that can contribute to that. Um, or these are two factors that are duly contributing to one another and that this is something that needs to be uh, accounted for when it uh, when a person decides to get behind a wheel and this is can only really become beneficial to kind of help educate people on that because it perhaps doesn't seem quite as well connected as the other things like if you take a medication that impairs your balance or makes you dizzy they're always going to say at the end of a drug commercial do not operate heavy machinery while under this drug. You're not going to really hear a doctor tell their patient who has low physical fitness and is obese, make sure not to, uh, you know, you <laughs> use heavy machinery while in your state, while in this current state. And so it's uh, there's a kind of disconnect there that there needs to be perhaps more education on that. You need to be aware that because of the state you're in there's going to be an increased likelihood that your ability to drive is going to decline. And so we need to have some intervention that's going to try and either help mitigate that risk or to try and just reverse their state altogether so that they can kind of try and eliminate that risk. So consequences of age-related driving and uh, changes in older adults, uh, it's kind of cyclical here. So an older adult experiences a decline in physical or mental abilities. This leads to changes lead to the decline in driving skill, more accidents, reduced driving. Mobility is now re reduced. This then leads to the individual scope of activities is reduced. This leads to an older adult experience as a decline in physical or mental ability. So this is why taking away driving is not viable. You take away driving, you're going to put them into this cycle immediately that is going to uh, lead to their own kind of poor outcomes. Now there's definitely a debate that well this is going to help save lives by taking them out of uh, by removing them from the road um, but if it comes at the cost of their own life it, it seems to kind of be a lose-lose in many situations so what's an alternative way to be able to uh, have them maintain their driving and their independence but without them having to do that with risk. And you know, by the time this was published in 1998, that was well before Uber and Lyft. And so it could be that there is definitely a, a greater possibility for older adults to be able to still have independence um, by using these type of ride services um, compared to being able to have to drive themselves. But of course, people enjoy driving. So it's a, it's a difficult um, thing to have to try and uh, mitigators or try to uh, kind of work around because of those issues so everyone's going to have their own preference um, but per potentially with the more education that we give to older adults about these issues then that might make them to have make a decision that you know what even though I love driving I also uh, like not getting in car crashes so uh, potentially I'm going to change my behavior because of that or at least be more aware. That's a, essentially all you can do is to try and increase awareness. So adapting to age-related driving changes in older adult. There's a strategic compensation. You can try to be more decisive about when you're going to go for a drive. Uh, try to understand when the driving conditions are optimal. Uh, try to drive more slowly. Try to be more certain of when to go. Um, create greater distance between vehicles, um, wait for bigger gaps, avoid driving when rushed or stressed. It also requires that if everybody drove this way, there would probably be a lot less um, fatalities from motor accidents. Um, so we already talked about education. That's the number one thing. It potentially could even be um, courses in counseling that can be given to older adults. And if this were something that the DMV were to try and um, implement a kind of resource for older adults to be able to take a driving class that would 
help improve their ability to drive or at least to give them a kind of compensatory strategy to be able to drive more safely that would perhaps be hugely beneficial not making it mandated but just to kind of help first educate and then offer the option would probably be the best way and changing societal attitudes regarding privilege of driving and so getting behind a car that's perhaps about 2,000 pounds and full of flammable fluid gallons of flammable fluid and thinking that that is uh, something that you're entitled to might be something to change as well it's an interesting topic it's an interesting thing to consider if I think we believe that we're entitled to be able to just do this at will but these attitudes are something that were kind of shaped by car companies it used to be that a lot of there were a lot of fatalities when cars first entered the road because people would just walk on the street because there weren't cars before and walking on the street was considered normal but then there were a lot of fatalities because people would get run over because they weren't paying attention to cars being on the road because they weren't expecting it and drivers were still relatively new there was no DMV there were no driving tests back then so there's an issue here between public health and these new fangled machines called automobiles and so this is um, inevitably when car companies went on the offensive and said you know what people are being irresponsible by just walking into the street and these are people these jaywalkers are people that should be punished not the cars and this is what changed culture is that now the attitude of that the car has you know should be on the road and the pedestrian should be on the sidewalk is now something that is well understood but this was only something that was kind of propagated because of car companies trying to basically protect their own self-interest um, so you know we still see a lot of fatalities of cars and human beings trying to share the same kind of common space being in sidewalk and street or otherwise and so even though this is something that is kind of not as debated before it used to be a huge debate but basically the car companies kind of got their way by saying that people should not be on the street they should essentially be relegated to the sidewalks and cars should be the only ones on the roads um, yeah so look up where the term jaywalking came from it's actually pretty bad uh, activities of daily living older adults may lose the ability to care for themselves leading to a loss of independence ADL so an ADL is an activity of daily living an example of that is eating sitting to standing getting in and out of bed dressing brushing teeth and bathing so imagine if you lost any one of these things how drastically different your life would be and a uh, independent activity of daily living would be like cooking, doing laundry, taking medications, handling personal finance and shopping. And if we begin to see drops in any of these ADLs, at least one or more of them, then this is a sign uh, that we're considering that uh, they've lost some independence to the degree that we're probably suspecting that they are suffering from other types of cognitive declines or overall um, cognitive uh, kind of disorder or disease such as like dementia and this is something that we now need to try and treat um, and if we can't treat it well then we're going to have to try to think of some kind of assisted living or in-home care so 50% of those above 85 have difficulty with one or more ADLs or IADLs or an IADL not independent but instrumental activities of daily living all right let's see where we are right now 11 slides to go I think I'm gonna break this up into two parts to make it a little bit more manageable yeah we're gonna do that okay so I'm gonna be back with another recording this recording is just going to stop here at slide 25 26 and then the next recording will continue from here because now we're gonna talk more about kind of therapies of older adulthoods Okay, so I just want to break this up so that this whole thing doesn't turn out to be like an hour and 15 minutes long, so that it kind of makes it a little bit more easier to digest it as we go. Okay, all right, see you in a little bit. Uh, part two, coming at you.